Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of News on China with uh, Tings and Marco. And uh, we, this is our second episode. We literally just decided about five seconds ago we're just going to call this News on China from now on. And um, so this is going to be our second episode. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through the news clippings that you have, which is your 38th episode on your own channel. Uh, but before we get into that, how are you guys doing this morning? Good. I mean, I had a really late night working till 4 a.m. So we're feeling it this morning. If we're a little bit more groggy than usual, I apologize. I wish it was a hangover or something. Yeah, exactly. It like would be that. much better. Yeah, but... I was just actually staying <laughs> it's up. It's a work evening. hangover. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All, all of the same tiredness as a hangover, but there wasn't a good party last night to, to write home about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Next um, time we hope so, to do better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. Yeah, no, I appreciate you still making it. Uh, we pushed this out a little bit later, but I know how those mornings are sometimes. Um, actually, you know what? Before we get into uh, this week's stories, uh, I want to. there's one common thing that came up, and I think it probably has to do with the rebranding. Um, there were a few people who mentioned in the comments saying, well, the Chinese is actually saying... Um, Dongfeng, uh, but your news is called Dongsheng. Uh, was there a rebranding, or uh, what's the what's the reason for the disconnect with those two? Yeah, I mean, that you your your uh, viewers are very very perceptive. We also saw those comments, and that's correct. I mean, one of the things when we first started launching this, you know, we knew the kind of story about the Dongfeng, which is you know kind of an anti imperialist story of the warships. Um, or in, invading warships and then setting fire in the eastern wind that basically like uh, uh, the last last uh, breath of wind that carries the fire to destroy the attacking uh, warships. So we thought it was a nice imagery, you know, about um, about kind of resistance and, and that. And has a nice name because it's the eastern winds. We're bringing like winds from the east, news from the east. But we also found something out that it's also the name of the... Chinese missiles. So, you know, we realized that it's not the most, you know, like almost Google all of them. <laughs> yeah. Name. If you start wanting to know about the yeah. missiles. Uh, so. Listen, yeah, yeah. Listen to our news or, or we've got missiles. <laughs> exactly. No, that's good. So, yeah. yeah, we just so, have to change more voices from the East. And yeah. I think it's a little bit more appropriate for what we're trying to bring. Okay, so it was related to a rebranding. I think that's a pretty good reason to rebrand. I mean, this is all about <laughs> sharing some friendly news, um, which sometimes gets lost in um, in all the stuff that's going on. So no, that's good. Um, all right, so how about we go into, we're not exactly sure how this format's going to evolve, how long each episode's going to take, but we're going to focus on four stories. Uh, I believe it's four stories you have uh, lined up for us, yeah. right? Yeah, okay, so we'll do that. But first of all, watch the video, which has not necessarily the four stories we're talking about, or it might have more of it, but we'll look at your um, video first, and then we'll go into some of the stories that you want to talk about today. So let's start with that here. Here we go. All right, great. So that is the 38th uh, episode that you put out on your channel. And then from here, what we'll do, we'll go into the stories that you um, would just like to bring out and talk about a little bit. Um, and so I'll pass it over to you guys. We can start with uh, story one. What do we have for the first story? So the first story um, that came, it was an announcement that came out, um, I guess, just over a week ago. Uh, something we found quite interesting when the central government here issued uh, an unusual uh, and a strong public denouncement of its own energy agency. So it's called the National Energy Administration. Um, so the inspectors from the central government had uh, made many, many visits, particularly to the eastern provinces, uh, where the, you know, the pollution is slightly heavier. Uh, and, and it checked 
and found that uh, at least 121 coal mines were producing 30% more fuel than the regulated levels. So they had in this public statement, they reprimanded them for, you know, failure to prioritize environmental protection, enforcement, uh, and also insufficient protections in place. So I we, we thought this is quite interesting um, because it's a, a, and we've talked to many of our Chinese colleagues and said, this is unusual to make a public uh, denouncement like this. And with the denouncement was also saying, the body needs to rectify uh, its own failings within 30 days and disclose that to the public. And they better do it. <laughs> they better do it. Um, so what com it comes in the heels of, uh, obviously we talked about it uh, a bit last week um, on you know the, in, the huge commitment to, to climate change, which is the 2060 carbon neutrality commitment made at the end of last year um, around September or in September. So this could be seen as one of the ways that how seriously uh, the government is taking this uh, and in terms of even publicly uh, denouncing its own agency for its failures. And um, I think just to step back a bit and to give context to the listeners here, um, what we've learned around some of the impressive um, gains and the environmental front, especially on this carbon neutrality and leadership on this carbon neutrality question, is that there's a kind of multi-pronged approach that the Chinese government has been doing. We have to remember that China is the global, the biggest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. Um, it, it emits 20% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it burns half of the world's coal. Uh, and in order for it to actually get to this 2060 carbon neutrality goal, it would have to actually reduce by 90% its current emissions. Um, and that would be, I mean, we mentioned it last time too, but that's shaving off 0.2 to 0.3 degrees Celsius. That seems small when you kind of put it in, in that number, but when you think about the global scale, I mean, the Paris Accord, um, the whole the whole limit that we're trying to kind of control climate change on a, a global scale is 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level. So if if China's contribution could be 0.2 or 0.3, um, that that actually has you know we're uh, a huge you know could save humanity. Let's talk about that. But the multi-pronged approach, and we see this um, interesting headline um, as part of one cutting emissions. So you got to cut you got to you got to reprimand those who are. Um, going beyond the the uh, the you know allowable levels, and including the agencies that are regulating them. You know, it's also a big challenge because China um, depends fifty eight percent of the energy in China comes actually from coal, so it's mm -hmm. it's going to be a big challenge to change the the like the the source of energy. I mean, they're doing. We just talked last time about how much they doubled uh, in the last year. They doubled the capacity of both solar and wind energy, but still it's 58% coal. So this, right. with this, they're kind of reeling in their own agencies, reeling in, calling out the kind of the big emitters. So that's number one of the strategy. At the same time, uh, what happened last year, they, they made this announcement at the same time that they actually increased the coal production last year. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, um, China, for the first time in the first quarter of last year, went um, for the first time in 40 years, wasn't it? Actually, had a negative growth, and then it, obviously we know it rebounded and started, in, you know, manufacturing picked up uh, and became, uh, especially as the world was shutting down, became once again, uh, you know, a kind of hyper factory of the world to produce. So that means the coal demands actually increased. So one of the things that I think a lot of people in the West have been criticizing. And, and doubting um, this commitment to uh, carbon neutrality is that, well, you've actually created new plants in the last year. But this is just giving a context of why those new plants were needed. Um, uh, they actually added, this is um, the equivalent is 40 gigawatts of coal energy last year of plants. That's equivalent, very interesting to hear, the equivalent of all of South Africa's coal production. So just to get a wow. sale that was added last year. But at the same time, it had a record of um, uh, addition of wind, solar uh, energy production as well, doubling its production in a year. And it contributed 71 gigawatts in the renewable sector. It's already a leader in renewables. That's the equivalent of what the entire world added in wind and solar energy, just China. So they have this, you know, they're, they're doing this multi-pronged approach. Like we know right now, currently, this is the kind of necessary sacrifices we have to make. We're increasing coal, but we're calling out those who are violating our own regulations 
including our own regulators, but we're also amping up in impressive speeds the, the wind and, and solar and all the renewable energy. And just right, to add yeah. one last mm -hmm. thing on this, because you know commitments can sound good on paper and commitments also we know there's some countries that don't name also pull out and come back and as they wish into these types of you know global accords and global commitments. But um, one, um, there's a, uh, a study or, or a report by Barbara Finnamore, who's an environmental lawyer, one of these international um, uh, environmental advocates. And she's saying, in, it was in a Guardian article, and she was saying that, oh, do we, do we trust these ambitious promises of China? She says, I think so, because Canada has a track, uh, sorry, China, excuse me, China has a track record of un under promising and over delivering. So if we look mm. back at the Copenhagen Accord, uh, if we look back even on the, the, yep. the demands of the, the yes. Paris Accord, consistently, I mean, if you're interested, we can go through them, consistently actually have met the deadlines before and over and above what was required. So this is, you know, carbon uh, production, we're talking about non-fossil fuel share, amount of reforestation. Um, in all these sectors, basically, um, it has achieved before. The Copenhagen Accord was achieved three years before schedule. So there's a lot to right. say that um, uh, this kind of new wave or new, new, new commitment is something that, you know, lots to be done, but um, something for us to be hopeful about, too. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so the criticizing the government, that's going to be obviously an important part of it. I have seen them do it before a few times, and it was actually environmental related a couple of years ago. It had to do with uh, one environmental uh, agency in one province um, who wasn't staying on top of, I, I think it was a... a um, sewage that was being piped out from the uh, or chemicals that were being piped out from factories they were reprimanded pretty seriously for that but that's going to be a, an important part of it for people who try to kind of game the system I remember seeing many years ago I think it was in Shanghai there were these monitoring stations uh, that were monitoring the pollution and like they were they were misting them or something like that they were putting like uh, uh, a, a, the local government officials who had certain targets to reach they they were like spraying mist on it or something like that to get the numbers down so I'm sure they're going to stay on top of this because they look at this stuff and then they create these feedback systems they're like okay we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again so for example like uh, when you build a food factory I'm familiar with this from looking at building a brewery and, and having a, a brewing location now everything is automated where you know if you say you're going to pipe out a certain amount of uh, water uh, every day there's automated uh, systems underground that actually track that and if you go over your registered limit they know immediately it goes it gets signaled to the uh, the office so they make it more and more difficult to gain the system but if they're if they're going to push this really aggressive uh, target i mean this is what this is what uh, they've got to do so it's very encouraging to see them um, reprimand that local uh, that local government um, and, uh, what was, that? was, there was another thing that came up when you were talking, I can't remember now, but, uh, it, yeah, but generally speaking, oh yeah, I remember the, um, it was interesting when you were talking about that the, uh, China, uh, takes up the majority of the kind of carbon emissions in the world. Now, if I remember correctly, you guys might know better than me the, overall, the, uh, per, per capita, uh, carbon emissions is lower than a lot of uh, developed countries. Is that, is that correct? Sure. I mean, if you're actually spreading across about 1.4 billion people, um, uh, yeah. that's why the absolute numbers don't work. I don't actually have it on the top of my head, but that's absolutely correct. Right. And that, that's actually remarkable, not not just because, you know, because obviously there's a lot of people that live in the countryside and stuff like that. And maybe that number isn't very surprising on its own. But when you take into consideration that China is manufacturing the majority of the world's goods, and you, they've got to also divide that across their entire population, it's still it's still pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, and so now, um, and if for the foreseeable future, most of the kind of, you know, uh, products are going to be produced here. Um, that's great news for the, for the, for the entire world. So, yeah, no, that's, that's great. Glad to see that. Especially, I, I remember last time we were talking, I said that I remember seeing, um, like 10 years ago, a video of, uh, um, I think there were university students in Shanghai saying that their number one concern when they were asked, their number one concern for the future of China was, uh, environmental concerns. Um, so it's amazing to see this kind of, um, being pushed forward. Um, so if you didn't, if you didn't have anything else to add on that one, that's a very interesting story. Great one to highlight. We can move on to the, uh, to the second story. What do you have for us uh, next? Okay. So second story, it's about the so-called the digital silk road, which is a part of this huge, uh, project. Yes, that's exactly. So, um, so basically China just announced together with, um, 
on the country, especially Pakistan, also uh, just like last week, they are about to uh, finalize the final stretch. They're laying the final stretch of the of the cables, uh, the fiber optic cables, which is going to be yeah a network coming from. Oh, by the way, just uh, guess where in China these cables are coming from. I you it looks can like see Xinjiang them. there. Exactly. What? Exactly. So coincidentally, <laughs> yeah. coming from Xinjiang, um, it's a, a, a very important topic for foreign politicians right now. Uh, but exactly. we won't get too much into that. We won't get into too much of that. We're, I think everybody knows well, exactly why it's a focus of attention. But yeah, exactly. But the interesting thing is that you can see in the map, it's a huge project. It's 15,000 kilometers of uh, fiber optic cables who is connecting like China, Pakistan, and then as you can see, many countries in Africa, Egypt, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, Seychelles in South Africa, but also go until France. So there's many interesting aspects of that. Uh, oh, first of all, also the name. The Chinese, they, they love this, put these poetic names and things. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's called the, the Peace, uh, which is the Pakistan East Africa Connecting Europe. That's the name of the this all this in red um because uh, yeah so it's peace uh but this is a huge project it's um mm -hmm. so um digital silk road actually was announced first time actually was mentioned as a plan was 2015 uh mm -hmm. and the first time the president she announced was in 2017 uh it was actually the first um belt and road forum in beijing uh, that was the first time he said, okay, we are doing that. We are, we are creating this digital Silk Road, which would be um, in the BRI, would be our, um, our uh, what is it called, the branch of, of everything related to high technology. So it's not only about the cables, the cables is a story of the week, uh, but also in terms of infrastructure, you still have to think about the satellite system, the Beidou, which uh, is the so-called the Chinese GPS, who actually uh, just started to uh, work like in like uh, uh, full. It was full implemented uh, last year. So Beidou has more or less thirty-five satellites around the world. It's actually more accurate now than the GPS. And, I, uh, I've actually heard that that uh, the even the uh, there was some article or something that even the U.S. military was using it because it's um, more accurate than their I, I don't know if it's called the NASTAT system or whatever the old system is. It's it's far more accurate. <laughs> so that's quite exactly. interesting. And you know what? There's yeah. an interesting story. One one thing that we published last year, it's also more accurate in in in, in few countries because of something very uh, curious. For instance, that there was this um, there was this article about uh, Ethiopia. Because you know that uh, both GPS and Beidou, the systems, they also count with the cell phones of the people to uh, be more accurate. So it's like a, the sign is going back and forth, satellites to uh, the cell phones of the people. But turns out that, of course, in Africa, much more, much more people have Chinese phones than uh, other countries' phones. So they all have the, the Beidou installed in their navigators. So at the end of the day, they also count with the, with the more cell phones on the ground to get more accuracy than the GPS. So it's, it's also interesting to think like the whole system, how it works and how much the presence in China in many uh, global South countries is also make this possible. So, um, so, at, at, at so, so far, there's estimation or until last year, an estimation of 79 billion uh, US dollars spent on the digital Silk Road. Uh, but the estimations for the whole project says that it can uh, reach 200 billion uh, US dollars in terms of the full implementation, not only the cable, the satellites, but also many other nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, um, quantum computer. So, I mean, there's many other um, also aspects of the project. But I think the also the most important thing is to think which countries we are talking about. We're talking about countries that never had access to this kind of technology and probably wouldn't be able to access this technology if it wasn't for the partnership uh, with China. And so that's that's uh, uh, the whole uh, Belt and Road Initiative is all about. Uh, so <clears throat> one last thing is uh, also in case of Pakistan, 
it's also interesting because so the, if you see again the map so you have this uh the, the whole country the pakistan it has cable uh, yeah this is almost like the the last thing one of the last uh, stretches they are doing now it's coming from uh rawapindi uh i don't know if it's the correct uh pronunciation we practice before we practice yeah on. rawapindi in in northeast of pakistan and it's connecting mm -hmm. to the port of uh Gwadar and 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 also to karachi and what happened to Wadar, it's a huge port that was also funded by China and it's uh, also uh, partially run also by Chinese company. Uh, Gwadar port was actually built to be a sort of like a huge hub of the region. Uh, but so far, guess what was the main problem that didn't allow Gwadar to be like a sort of more uh, protagonist in the region in terms of a, a hub, commercial uh, hub. They don't have internet. They don't have good internet. So that was uh, the main limitation so far for the port uh, to be able to uh, become like a, a more um, like a, a big hub of the region. And now, exactly now, they are about to um, to complete the, the project. But if you think about the countries in Africa, imagine what would be for Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, even South Africa uh, mm -hmm. to be able to access um, a better internet, uh, like a stable, also more uh, more securities. Because also one interesting thing is that, of course, uh, in the whole region, most of the cables, most of the providers are from Western countries or mm -hmm. from from India. So this is actually it's going to be also an alternative in terms also of the security of the transmission of data. Uh, because now they have more options, they can also rely on, on the Chinese um, technology. Do you? No, I mean, yeah. I think it's just the same thing in terms of thinking about Beidou and what it offers, like this kind of level of technology. I mean, just to remember who, how many countries have their own uh, global positioning yeah. systems. You know, you have the US with the GPS, you have European Union, you have Russia, yeah. and now you have China. So providing these kinds of options for especially kind of, let's say, the poor poor nations around Africa and Asia, particularly, um, it's a huge possibility of not having this reliance on on the Western providers and, and yeah. that kind of dominance. So if this is seen yeah. as an option. It's a, and this is the kind of agency I think we actually have to highlight sometimes about the, yeah. the engagement with China. People, our countries are actually right. choosing often to engage with China um, given these kinds of conditions. Right. I think there's uh, two important components. Uh, the so one is, uh, for, first of all, I mean, having having competition is good. But you, this is a matter of also bringing in a level of infrastructure and access that some places don't have at all. But for the countries that do have Western options, I mean, this is a great situation that there's new t now two possibilities. You're not overly reliant on one. Um, and it creates an incentive for the owners of those two different networks to be a good actor. If you're the only option in town, you're not, you know, you, there, there's there's fewer consequences when you get caught, you know, spying on Angela Merkel or any of the other things that happened on Western telecommunications networks. You know, if China never does that, if they never use their network for that, obviously the the, the, the story being painted is that this is what they're going to use it for. And the people who are saying that are who who are using their own networks to do the very same, the very thing that they're afraid China will do. As, as long as China doesn't do that, it's going to become a more and more attractive option. And then perhaps the, 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 the owners of the Western networks, they're, they're going to be forced to saying, OK, all right, now we've got to put some checks and balances in place. We can't really take advantage of the system anymore like this because, we, we, you know, um, there's another option. There's another player in town. So, no, that's that's great. I think were you going to add something else just before I uh, before I interrupted there? Um, no, no, I think it's I think it, that's it. I mean, it's just like the, um, because one of the, the, the things about the relationship between China and Africa is that I mean sometimes it's painted as oh China is is getting all the natural resources and and oh this is bad for the countries exploiting the countries and and or the other story is that oh China is helping the poor Africa oh China aid to Africa so this is also something to um, think about it because this is as things were saying it's it's, it's the agency of the African countries it's it's a, it's a good uh, deal for both. So yes, uh, Africa has a lot of natural resources that China needs actually to keep up with with the huge uh, uh, growth, industrialization actually. 
but also China has things to offer that this, this country needs. So it's right. actually, as, as they, they, they like to say here, it's a win-win, it's a win-win uh, deal. And, um, and I think the whole story is also talking about a possible model for the whole global south. Because uh, I'm sorry if you, we just saw this week, the numbers of the U.S. investments in, in Africa. Yeah, yeah, please go, go. It's, it, I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, I actually was just pulling that up for anyone who's interested. It's the Gen Africa Research Institute uh, initiative with the John Hopkins University. Um, some researchers out there following closely China, Africa. But the main thing is, because uh, a few weeks ago, um, they they mapped out the foreign direct investment and compared it over the last stretch, I think since 2003 till the present, between the U.S. and in China. And there has been a sharp decline over the last seven or eight years of U.S. foreign and uh, investment, foreign direct investment, which means that you know this is this is a kind of the kind of thing that China has been consistently investing in and increasing foreign direct investment to build bridges, ports, this kind of infrastructure that lasts, that you know, also creates jobs, yeah. um, but also means that you know we're talking about people's real lives, you know, being able to access internet or global GPS system or alternatives to that. Um, and that means it's real investment in money. It's not. Um, yeah. It's not. It's, so it's a very interesting thing. We can send it to you after as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. That that is interesting. I think it's not only a matter of uh, how much is being spent, but it's also how it's being spent. So you know, if we see when China's going in, if they're doing more than just building enough infrastructure to get the product from the mines or wherever it's coming from to the ports, um, then they're not really offering a better option. If they're doing things that are going to benefit a larger group of people, um, like this, you know, fiber optic network and all of these things, bridge imports outside of the scope of just getting the resources out. Yeah. Um, then that's it's a kind of competition that's much better. I mean, even if they were spending half uh, of what the U.S. was um, uh, spending, which isn't the case, but um, they were doing it in such a way that it would bring, bring greater benefit to a larger number of people, um, then um, yeah, it's 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 finally bringing some other possible positive options. Doesn't mean it's perfect. Doesn't mean it's uh, you know not going to be without its problems. But um, it's really encouraging to see an additional option come up like this. Yeah, and it, it's all. I mean, it's it's and it's not a. Of course, it's a big interest of of China and and Chinese mm -hmm. companies, technology companies. They 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 need more market, and also of course, they, it's it's very good for them to have like fifteen thousand kilometers of cable. Uh, you have this the company, the Hantong uh, Group, which is the biggest uh, producer or of uh, fiber up cables. They are the main ones. They are leading a consortium with uh, companies in in Pakistan, in Hong Kong also from Africa and even like it's interesting because Huawei it's also part of this project Huawei has like its own company it's called Huawei uh, Marine that is is laying one of the stretches of the the whole system but now of course Huawei it's considering actually to uh, sell Huawei Marine to Huntong Group maybe to try to escape of, uh, uh, of the sanctions against Huawei so it's also the mm -hmm. tension that it's 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 um, happening right now yeah. 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 I think you're going to probably see more of that where um, no matter whose hands it's in, if it's coming from China, I think there's going to be a lot of creative work done to try to, uh, um, you know, uh, put roadblocks in place uh, to prevent these things from going up. But but, but judging by that map uh, that you shared with us and everything like that, they've already made some pretty good headway um, in that regard. That's probably a good lead, way, uh, lead into uh, your third story, which is uh, still uh, telecommunications related. Yeah, this is this is a very interesting story. I mean, it's not like brand new because it's coming in the next in the last um, uh, weeks. Uh, yeah, so it's about Ericsson. Uh, actually, the news of the week is that Ericsson just released uh, the results of the Q4 uh, of 2020, and it actually was pretty good. They they had an increase of. Um, um, increase like 60% year on year in Q4, uh, their profits. So that was a very, like a 850 million US dollars just in Q4 uh, of 2020. But Ericsson now is facing a big contradiction, which is actually, it's a very interesting story because it raises like a higher level of contradiction maybe so far in all this um, fight between US and Huawei and uh, and China, because what happened is that so the Swedish government 
Well, it's in the process now of setting the auction for uh, the implementation of the 5G network in the country. So last year, the government already uh, signaled that, oh, we are not going to allow Huawei to, um, not uh, Huawei, neither uh, ZTE, which is the you know, the big uh, 5G Chinese company. So they say, no, Huawei is not going to be allowed to participate of the, of the auction because reproducing uh, what US, uh, US narrative is say, oh, they are going to spy on us. Uh, they're using Huawei as an agent to spy on Swedish um, government affairs. But what happened is that guess who in Sweden was defending uh, Huawei? It was Ericsson. Ericsson is one of them. Exactly. Ericsson is actually the third uh, a big company, a global company in, in 5G. You have Huawei, you have uh, Nokia from Finland, and then uh, you have Ericsson, who has 14% uh, percent of the market share in, in the planet right now. But, mm -hmm. but then, okay, so Ericsson was defending, and they actually they brought the, the case to the Supreme Court. So it was Ericsson defending the um, market freedom, we need competition, it's good for us that Huawei comes because we also have uh, a partnership, it's good for the technology of the country, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, the Supreme Court said, no, we are not going to allow Chinese companies to be part of the auction. So <laughs> what Ericsson now, the CEO of Ericsson, is now threatening, uh, his name is uh, Bordi Elkholm, so now he's threatening to leave Sweden. Say, okay, guys, you guys don't want to work with Huawei. We want to work with Huawei and the Chinese. So we're going to leave the country. We're going to move. We're going to move out. And of course, there's a, the, st the story behind this is that uh, in the last year, there was many negotiations between uh, Ericsson and the Chinese government. Because right now, Ericsson has around 10% of the 5G market in China. And remember... Mm -hmm. We're talking about a huge, the, I mean, by far the biggest 5G market in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. China has now around 200 million users of 5G, which means 85% of the, the, the users in the planet. And of course, 200 million in China is still very small for China, Chinese proportions and, and, and potential. So, I mean, the market is going to grow a lot. So there's right. been negotiations between Ericsson and the Chinese um, government and companies to actually give more space to uh, Ericsson because at the end of the day, even Huawei and ZTE, I mean, they can't keep up. It's, it's, it's a lot of people. It's a huge market. So these negotiations was like very good until the end of the year when this started to happen. So now, of course, Ericsson, it's also fearing that, oh, maybe China, China will retaliate. And they are saying, yeah, they will be right because this is what you do in bilateral trade negotiations. I mean, if a country uh, actually uh, harms your economy, man, you're going to defend yourself. This is this is how geopolitics works. So it's not Ericsson is just saying, guys, you're crazy, and especially because Huawei, it's by far the leading company in 5G. They have a better technology and they have cheaper technology. Some analysts say that they might be one or two years ahead of Nokia and, and Ericsson. So, of course, also for them, it's, it's for Ericsson, it's good to have Huawei to, to, close to, to work together. They have some projects together. And, and of course, it's an exchange of uh, technologies. Um, but the last thing is that actually the... I don't know if you guys remember, but we we had like a also a, a big story like a few months ago was in UK when UK actually also banned Huawei uh, from uh, from the five G in the country. Uh, well, first, actually, what happened is that the the national security agents or something like that they made some the tests and they say no, no, Huawei it's okay, it's it's safe. It's not what the uh, U.S. is claiming. But at the end of the day, you know, like U.S. is like pushing hard in many countries, many of its allies to uh, exclude Huawei from 5G. So at the end of the day, Boris Johnson said, yes, OK, let's um, let's ban Huawei. They have, mm -hmm. a, I think, until 2027 to take all equipments from Huawei to uh, U.K. But this will create a big loss for U.K.'s economy. Uh, even the Garden at that time, uh, they published um, a study that uh, had an estimation of 
the loss for UK economy because of the exclusion of Huawei would be at least seven billion pounds, which I think it's more than ten thousand, uh, ten million, ten billion US dollars. It's, it's a big mm. amount of money. They will delay the implementation of 5G because most of the, the 4G now it's Huawei. So when you exclude Huawei from the 5G, you need to also to uh, take all the 4G and also change because I mean you you need to communication between 4 and 5G. And so you are delaying implementation. And the worst thing is that some remote areas of, of the country, like rural areas, they are probably not going to get access to 5G because it's not profitable. And this is something that Huawei does a lot. For instance, in Africa, they provide 5G, like small villages in, in countryside of Kenya with 5,000 people. They don't make money on that, but they make money in, uh, in the bigger picture. So... So this happened in, in, in UK, but, but now with the Swedish case, you go like this contradiction goes to a higher level at a point of a company, a leading company of the world say, guys, bye bye. We're moving out because this is not how uh, the, the place should be. I mean, the, the match right. should be played. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And um, I think what people need to understand also is this isn't just a matter of, um, you know, Ericsson going up and saying, well, we want we want to make money in China, so we're going to go to bat for them there. It's got to come together with two elements. This is a technology company that's going to be able to find a back door in these kinds of things if it really does exist. So both elements need to be there where they're saying, OK, you know what, we don't want to lose the China market. And also, uh, we've looked at this stuff and there's no there's no sign of what these people are talking about if either of those things were missing i don't think they would have gone to bat for them if they did if they so so granted if they didn't have the chinese market and they still knew they said there's no back doors in this but we're going to keep quiet because it's, at this point it's good for us to remove one guy from competition but when those two elements come together um, you've got you've got a pretty compelling argument that okay maybe this isn't happening and at the end of the day it's the same kind of thing that happened with Microsoft when Microsoft uh, the 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 kind of executives there were, were being told oh you, you know you can't use uh, Huawei hardware anymore or anything like that there's there, there's back doors they went to the government and they said well, well we've checked we haven't found anything can you show us like what are you seeing what 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 are you talking about we we need evidence and. Um, that was the Trump administration at the time. Not that this administration is going to be any better in that regard, but they were just like, "Oh no, you know, just trust us." You know, if you if you saw what we saw, you'd know. And it's like that's not how it's supposed to work here. So the uh, the final decision is being made by politicians for purely political reasons. That's outside of any reality about what they're actually talking about. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, think, quite, it's quite think interesting. about Germany now. Think about Germany now. Do you think? I mean, do you think Germany didn't double? triple checked all the possible backdoors of Huawei. They did. They say, it's OK, we're going to use. So Germany yeah. just just made the decision. They're going to use Huawei. So I mean, Germany, I think they're pretty good in technology and will be able oh, yeah. to find if there are some backdoors say, OK, guys, sorry, we can't work with you. But it's it's going to Germany. So and by the and, way, the and, next and, chapter. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. sorry. No, no, uh, but well, just, just the next chapter, just announcing yeah. like in the future, maybe we, we come back here, it's going to be Brazil. Brazil is the, right. the next big, big uh, market, big auction of 5G, maybe three months from now. And it's, it's, a, it's a fight already, but we're going to come later to that. Yeah, that would be interesting to talk about, too. What's interesting with Germany, too, is uh, not only are they you know, pretty technical, uh, technologically advanced with this stuff, they've got some experience with backdoors because they were used on them by the U.S. So you think they'd be pretty alert to this stuff as well. Um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, same kind of thing that we were saying before. It's great to have competition. And at this point, you're probably going to see some real improvement where people are saying, no, this is not what we're going to use it for. Um, and, and then it becomes more about the fundamentals. Um, so with that, um, I think we're going on to our last story. What's the last story that you uh, you have for us? So shifting gears a little bit, uh, one of the things that we like to do with News on China is also bring a bit of history to the present, uh, you know, and often stories about people's life and culture. So the last story is about uh, an amazing artist, revolutionary, and one of the pioneers in the women's liberation movement here in China. Her name is Her Xianling. Um, so uh, she was actually one thing you, because you're down there in Shenzhen. I don't know if you actually checked out. There's an art museum, the He Xiangning Art Museum. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, in Nanshan District. So okay. uh, right now there's an exhibition at the art museum at the of the Beijing Fine Art Academy that's that's showing the collection from the Shenzhen Museum. 
Uh, so we took this opportunity to share a little bit about and dig into her history. So tell a little story. She's born, she was born in 1878 into a wealthy family. And remembering at that time, um, uh, women in, from wealthy families had a lot of pressure to bind their feet as part of a kind of a patriarchal tradition um, because, you know, small feet were seen as beautiful for, for women. So the story has it that as a young girl, uh, when her family was trying to, you know, bind her feet, she was quite inspired by stories she had heard about, about women soldiers and their sort of resistance and their strength. So she had hit a pair of scissors and would kind of night nightly, after her feet had been bound, would cut them. And at some point, the family just gave up because she consistently was defiant. So she never actually had bound feet in the end. But, you know, so her her kind of let's say feminist childhood took her into, you know, the period of, um, you know, at the end of the Qing dynasty. So that's the last, um, last uh, monarchy of China that ended with the Xinhai revolution in 1911. So she was part of that early, you know, formation of the new Republic under Sun Yat-sen or Sun Zhongshan, um, also from Guangdong. Um, so she was one of the early supporters in that organization, you know, in, called Chinese United, United League in English, which was anti-monarchist, but at the same time anti-imperialist. This is the time when there was a lot of foreign powers um, that through the opium wars, through the French, through Germany, through Japan, they had a lot of interest in China. So a big part of forming a republic- Occupy China. Occupy China. It was to actually create a national democratic republic at the time. Anyways, fast forward a little bit into the 20s. Uh, and the picture that you had showed is that she was actually the founder of the International Women's Day. I mean, we're not quite in March yet, but that's the 8th of March, an important day, especially in the you know, worker struggle right? um, for, for women. So she brought it in uh, in 1924, and it was under the banner, okay, the fight for women's liberation uh, is also in, involved in the national struggle. It's, a, and it's also the fight against um, imperialism and the fight against you know these kind of imperial forces in China, but also against the the feudal uh, feudalism that existed in the country. And I think um, wanted to highlight a couple of things you know that she actually contributed to the the women's movement um, at the time. Uh, not to get too deep into history, but in the 1920s it was still the period what what's called here is the United Front, the first United Front. Just to say that, you know, the two, two, there's lots of ebbs and flows in the history of how this revolution was created in China, but there are different periods where the nationalists and the communists worked together. This was in that period. So she was head of the women's, um, let's say, the department of that united front um, and part of the national movement. Um, and she she fought for many things. I mean, this is early 20s, so a quite, quite revolutionary and radical at the time. So for equality for women, legally speaking, but also economically speaking, and a right to education. So there are many kinds of proposals um, that she helped put forward, uh, the concrete proposals from the women's movement, for instance, equal pay for equal work, um, and even you know, right to work, uh, the right to inherit property, not be property, and various kinds of things like marriage laws, the right to, you know, uh, uh, consent to entering a marriage and also to be able to leave a marriage, divorce, amongst other things like maternity laws. You know, interestingly, many of these are the same things that I think women are interested in all over the world until today. You know, these, these, these 100 years later are the kind of demands that many women want around the world, you know, just the right for that kind of level of equality. Do you want to say something, right, Daniel? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, can you still uh, hear me? I, it was it was chopping up. I could still hear what you were saying, but it's getting a bit choppy. Can you still hear me okay now? It's, it's a little bit, bit choppy. choppy. Okay, give me one second. Let me just try to change my connection here. Give me one quick second. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is much better. I just changed to a my Huawei personal hotspot for my phone so oh, you're not I'm using not, Huawei that's why man come on I, maybe maybe I was maybe I was on an Ericsson network just now <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> now, now we're not going to throw any shade at Ericsson because they're standing they're standing up even for Huawei so yeah exactly <laughs> no, super no, super clear now so maybe it's a Nokia one <laughs> yeah yeah no sorry sorry about that uh, especially to uh, no, cut no. out in uh, s during such a, a great story of somebody who's uh, such a great person to celebrate in China um were, were, were there more points you wanted to add or you pretty much got through the main kind of uh, bits of that 
Yeah, I mean, I think the last thing to, to mention is that um, as you know, someone who makes art myself, a uh, really mm. interesting part of her is that she was also an artist. So she began uh, doing work in the kind of propaganda work you know, for this national cause. But then also um, the style, she, she did a lot of uh, classical uh, Chinese ink paintings. Um, and, and her subjects were things like plums and rivers, landscapes, mm -hmm. and lots of tigers. So like her, a tiger at the end of the video, yeah, it's, it's hers. Exactly. Yeah. So part of oh. the, her, her sense until her old age, she died in the, I think it was in the uh, 1972, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Is that she was trying to paint in the, especially in the socialist construction period, like after 1949, capturing the people's aspirations and the kind of spirit of, of developing the country. So, you know, the rivers and the, the growth and the nature, um, and uh, she loved painting lions and tigers, and uh, as a way to, and I, you know, from this quote, uh, translated, is that uh, to call for the Chinese people to wake up like a sleeping lion and be as majestic as a tiger, which I thought was just lovely. So it was a kind of call for the kind of the spirit of, you know, resistance, but at the same time of beauty in terms of the construction of a country, a very young country or republic being being, you know, birthed at that time. Awesome. That's really good. I, I, I'm really glad you shared that story. I didn't know too much um, about her. And this is um, a great opportunity for more people to learn about her. I'm going to make sure my kids know about her too and read into, into her a little bit more. Sounds like an absolutely fascinating person who is an... Yeah, you can take them to the really, museum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's here. Yeah, I, I do plan on doing that. But uh, such an important part of uh, history here. So it's good to see it being celebrated. Um, so with that said, I think we've gotten through all of our stories here, haven't we? So not bad. We're, we're, we're at um, we're at 48 minutes, which will probably be cut shorter when we cut out those pieces where we lost you on the Ericsson network. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Nokia. <laughs> right. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. We'll blame on Nokia. Yeah. This Finnish uh, technology. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, no. So, so uh, no, that was really good. I'm really looking forward to continue doing this. Obviously, I'm going to leave a link in the description here to your video, the episode 38 oh, that you great. have. Um, I encourage everybody to uh, head over there and uh, give you guys a subscribe. And we'll continue having these longer format discussions on the channel here. Um, so with that said, we, you have a nice little uh, thing here to say to wish everybody a happy, uh, uh, happy Chinese New Year, right? What, what is this image from? This is your... Uh, do you want so me to pull that up now? So this is colleague actually made this. Uh, yeah, sure. That's great. I mean, tomorrow is going to be the, you know, Spring Festival or New, New Year's Eve, the Chinese New Year's Eve. So this is just a little right. wish to, for all the viewers. Good health this year. We'll need it. Uh, mm, <laughs> so it's a yeah. little way to send us off. We yeah. all need it this yeah. year. Good health. We do. Um, I think a lot of people watching do as well, because I think there's a lot of people who aren't able to make it home this year. Um, whether yeah. they be, you know, um, overseas Chinese wanting to come back or even people who, uh, because obviously there's been a, a, a discouragement to travel around too much during Chinese New Year right now during the sensitive time uh, when we're trying to control COVID. Um, and then obviously you've got your um, frontline health workers in so many countries um, who are, you know, I saw some really nice videos of some uh, some some doctors of Chinese descent which who aren't going to make it home as well and they're just still working away in the hospital. Um, so a lot of heroes as well, but, uh, yeah, uh, it's, um, uh, it, it, it's sending our, our best wishes out to, to everyone, um, uh, especially them and, uh, hope everybody has a good, uh, Chinese new year and we'll be back together on another video, hopefully in about a week uh, from now or something like that. If, um, you guys have the uh, time to continue doing a weekly episode. So absolutely everybody's looking yeah, forward to that it. as well. Awesome. No, sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much oh. for joining and, uh, we'll see everybody you, on the Daniel. next episode. All right, take All right, care. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs>